Okay, so hi, um, hi everyone. My name is Charlotte Lush and I am the WDI Research Manager at Share Action. I am very excited to have an absolutely excellent panel of speakers here today to discuss mandatory and voluntary due diligence requirements for companies and for investors. Uh, so joining me today are Joanne Houston, EU Policy Officer at Frank Bold and Nikolai Pedersen, uh, Senior Specialist Sustainable Markets at UNPRI. So before we get stuck in, I will just run through a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so this is an open space session and we want it to be comfortable for all, regardless of experience. Please be respectful of others and engage with understanding. We encourage you to listen to the perspectives shared by others and to learn from these. Um, we are mindful that most people may be at home and that interruptions might happen from children, pets, um, etc. And that's obviously absolutely okay. If you need to leave the session for a moment, step away from your computer, please simply do so. I think that we are definitely all past the stage of, um, of being surprised by some of the working from home um, little surprises that can sometimes uh, crop up. We also have my wonderful colleague, Rosie McKenzie, um, who is the point of contact in the event of any technical challenges. So if you experience any difficulties, please do contact her and she will hopefully be able to help. Um, if you have any questions for our panelists during the session, please um, either pop them in the chat or raise your hand and we'll just answer them as we um, as we go through the session. If you could, um, if you are asking a question and if you could just introduce yourself and your organisation, that would be absolutely great. Uh, we want the session to be as interactive as possible, so please don't hesitate to answer, uh, to ask any questions that you may have. Um, so to start with, I will briefly provide you with some context to the issues that we'll be covering in the session, and then we'll get stuck into the discussion with our wonderful speakers. Okay, so for companies to be able to address their adverse impacts on society, they have to be able to identify them. Despite some progress in recent years, uh, companies still do not have the data that they need to be able to effectively respond to risk to people. In the 2020 WDI, almost 40% of companies did not say whether they'd identified any risks or restrictions to workers' rights to freedom of association and collective bargaining, um, even to say that none had been identified. We also saw that almost half of companies either do not monitor if supply chain workers have access to a grievance mechanism or did not say if they do. These levels of data don't reflect organizations' commitments. 91% of companies that took part in the WDI stated that they had a public commitment to respect human rights and 94% of companies publicly commit to prohibiting, identifying and preventing forced labour, modern slavery and human trafficking in their operations and supply chains. Without an adequate understanding of their risks and impacts, it's impossible for organisations to make these commitments a reality. Due diligence is one of the foremost tools available to companies to do this. This year's WDI showed that companies that conduct due diligence have an enhanced ability to protect workers' rights. They can better identify risks to human rights and they're more likely to be able to explain how they're taking action to respect rights. However, there is still some way to go until there's widespread adoption of these processes um, by companies and that due diligence is as robust as it needs to be. Voluntary and mandatory measures have a vital role to play in promoting this. They provide both investors and companies with guidance as to how they should act and what information they should gather. They also serve as a key tool in creating a cultural shift, raising ambitions and making due diligence the norm. Ultimately, this helps to drive progress towards a financial system that better addresses the pressing environmental and social challenges the world faces. So I will now hand over to our speakers for a deeper dive into some of the mandatory and voluntary developments currently happening on due diligence. Um, our speakers will first introduce themselves and then we'll move on to some questions. So Joanne, I will hand over to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. And, and thank you very much for inviting me to be part of uh, today's discussion, which is very timely and, and very interesting to, to have. Um, my name is Joanne Houston. I'm EU Policy Officer at Frank Bold. And what I'll try to do today is to tell you a bit about our work in the field of corporate reporting. So focus on the transparency side of uh, human rights impacts and risks, and also connect that to human rights due diligence. So what's the link between reporting and the substantive obligations that companies uh, should have in order to advance integration of respect for human rights in their, in their operations. And I also try to give you a bit of, um, let's say, 
um, an overview of what to expect at European uh, level. I myself am based in, in Brussels. Um, and for a bit of background, I think I'll tell you a bit about Frank Bold and the Alliance for Corporate Transparency. So Frank Bold, the organization I, I, I work in is a purpose-driven law firm. And we have a nonprofit section working on different areas of work, including responsible companies. And as reflected in the, in the name of, of our team, uh, we focus, of course, on advancing uh, sustainability in corporate practices. And the reason we're, uh, you know, we're, we're focused on two specific issues, actually, on with regards to how to advance corporate sustainability in companies. And that's sustainable corporate governance on the one hand and corporate transparency on relevant risks and uh, sustainability impacts on the other hand. And the reason we're focusing on this is because back in 2016, we conducted um, roundtable discussions at a global level. Uh, under what we call the purpose of the corporation project to try and understand and engage leading experts when it comes to corporate sustainability. Uh, we try to understand how can we best advance the integration of sustainability, the respect for human rights and the environment and so on. And um, addressing sustainable corporate governance and improving the legal framework around sustainability reporting were two of the most viable uh, solutions and, and options that emerged from, from these discussions, which is why we're focusing um, on this. And just to give you a bit of an of a, of a overview of why we focus on, on reporting and, and why we're so engaged in, in these discussions, we have Philip Greger, who's head of the responsible companies section at uh, Frank Bold. So the section I myself work in was part of the informal working group that advised the European Commission on, um, on the EU Non-Financial Reporting Directive. And he, he also chairs the European Coalition for Corporate Justice, which is uh, strongly involved in, in human rights, due diligence, uh, legislation at European level. So we've been working on the topic for a very long time. Um, and we took, uh, you know, based on this expertise and, and the experience in the field, Frank Bold set up the Alliance for Corporate Transparency which is um, a civil society led organization and initiative, which is coordinated by Frank Bolt and brings together 21 NGOs, uh, including uh, Share Action, to provide evidence on the need to further standardize corporate sustainability reporting requirements to improve transparency on relevant human rights impacts, environmental impacts, and so on, and ultimately to provide policy recommendations uh, at European level on how to improve uh, and how to achieve better results in, in this sense. Um, and perhaps I will stop here and tell you more about the research and what, what we looked into with the Alliance for Corporate Transparency at a later stage. Um, I'll hand over back to, to Charlotte, uh, but this is just a bit of an introduction of who I am, what Frank Bold is and, and what the Alliance for Corporate Transparency is before I go into the details of, of the research and, and what we focused on there and why it's relevant for our discussion today. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Sean. Uh, Nikolai, could you, um, would you be able to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks very much, Charlotte. Uh, also very happy to be part of this uh, discussion today. Um, I recognize a few of the names, but I'm just going to say a few words about um, the PRI and hopefully we're a small group so we can, we can, we can have an open conversation uh, about the topics today. So just for your, those of you who are not aware, the PRI um, was set up in 2006. Um, on the, the UN uh, with Kofi Annan, the Secretary General, and a group of uh, leading institutional investors, uh, primarily pension fund, uh, to establish uh, six principles essentially, which are about how um, environmental, social, and governance factors are um, uh, considered and implemented into investment processes, including stewardship activities and, and policy dialogue as well. Uh, our mission is uh, to facilitate a sustainable financial system. Um, so that is obviously uh, addressing some of the issues we're talking about today on the social side, but obviously also climate change, biodiversity, and a whole range of other sustainability issues. So we work with investors on these topics. Um, and one of the things we also do is we ask our members, our signatories, to report to the PRI on an annual basis. So we can go a little bit more into the details today, but one thing that I'd like to highlight uh, just to uh, people attending today is that the PRI put out in October last year, a position paper on human rights. Um, so this is a topic which we're putting a lot more attention to. Um, historically, we have worked on human rights issues with our members, but it's been really on a, on a voluntary basis. So we've had um, a very engaged group of signatories participate in collaborative engagement that the PRI has facilitated. Uh, for specific sectors to address human rights issues. 
Um, but when we look back, because we took stock last year, when we look back, it's around 5% of our secondary base. Um, so that's obviously not a lot. And what we want to try and do with this uh, increased attention to human rights is to make it much more of a mainstream issue. And this will manifest itself in the reporting uh, requirements for our signatories uh, already to some extent in the ongoing reporting um, window, which is now open, but even more so next year. Uh, and we, we can come back to that. Uh, but obviously under our human rights program, we also participate in public policy dialogue. Um, so we also do provide view from an institutional investor perspective to uh, some of these EST uh, data questions, as well as uh, obviously the very, um, very ongoing due diligence um, discussion that's happening in Europe. Uh, and we're seeing other interesting uh, initiatives around the world as well. Uh, but I'll leave it at that, Charlotte, and look forward to this discussion. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so I thought to start with, it would be good to look at sort of what the what the current state of affairs is when it comes to companies reporting. And um, so what what do we know about companies reporting at present and where do we stand um, currently? I think, Joanne, I'll hand over to you first. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So as I mentioned, going back to uh, one of the last uh, top aspects I mentioned earlier, Frank Bolt set up the Alliance for, for Corporate Transparency. Fear Action, as I mentioned, is part of this uh, alliance of, of NGOs. Um, and the reason we set up the Alliance for Corporate Transparency was, uh, as I mentioned, to provide evidence-based recommendations on the need to standardize corporate sustainability reporting requirements. And the reason we set the Alliance up is because although we recognize that the EU non-financial reporting directive, which is this directive, I'm sure most of you know, but companies with more than 500 employees across Europe are requested to produce a non-financial statement yearly on, on the impacts and the sustainability risks uh, associated with, with their companies. The reason we set up the Alliance was that we, although the NFRD was a good step forward in promoting corporate transparency on sustainability issues, it was very much principles based and it didn't provide a specific information that companies should be should be reporting on. So with the Alliance, we developed an in-depth methodology that covers several hundreds of environmental, social and, and governance criteria, extrapolating standards and indicators from existing reporting initiatives. So we didn't create anything new and we, we assessed the reporting practices of 1,000 companies in 2019 and of an additional 300 companies in 2020. So this is the broadest study to date, which assesses how companies are reporting against the requirements of the EU non-financial reporting directive and in general, whether the information that they provide in their non-financial statements is sufficient to allow for an understanding of how companies are, you know, identifying relevant risks and impacts and how they're managing those impacts and risks and whether they're setting objectives and what their, let's say, progress against those objectives and targets, uh, how, how that's going. So what I thought would be of interest would be just to uh, show you, if I manage to share my screen, just to show you um, the, let's say, interactive database where we've summarized all our findings. So as I mentioned, we have around several hundreds of criteria that we looked at. We looked at 1,000 company reports. So there's a lot of data um, covering not only human rights, but you know, other issues as well. But given the focus of today's discussion, it definitely be of interest, I think, to look at how companies are reporting, as, as asked by Charlotte as well. How is it that companies are reporting? Is information that they're providing relevant? So what I'll do is just, if you bear with me, share my screen. And I think you should be able to see it now, if I'm not wrong. Perfect, thank you very much. I see a few heads nodding. And um, if we scroll down from the Alliance for Corporate Transparency website and we go to look at general uh, human rights reporting and supply chain management, so all that information that is relevant to understand, for example, uh, how companies are, are approaching their human rights due diligence, whether you know, they're identifying risks and so on and so forth. What you can see here is a major gap between the amount of companies reporting specific information, so that's in, in dark blue, so whether that was policies, risks and out outcomes of policies, the amount of companies reporting relevant and specific information is always smaller than those that report either very general information or do not provide any information at all. So it's simply very difficult to understand how companies 
you know, are, are addressing these, uh, these, you know, how they're setting their policies, how they're addressing risks and so on and so forth. So this is a cross-cutting trend you can see under the human rights section of the uh, research, but also the supply chain management. And if we click on the, uh, let's say, the relevant section in the website, I can try and bring you to, I think it's my computer has frozen. So I can, okay, there we go. We move to the human rights section of, um, of the research. I just wanted to show you um, perhaps one of the most striking uh, results, uh, which I think is pertinent to, to today's topic. And that's, we see that 85.9% of companies that we assessed address the, the issue. I think Charlotte mentioned that in your research, you found that 91% of companies commit to human rights. So we have a similar, let's say, uh, finding, of course, the, the um, we assess different companies, but that's the trend. So most companies mention that they address human rights and they mention that that's a material hence relevant topic for them. But then if you look at the more specific information, then that's when the numbers start dropping. So we identified that only 22.2% of companies reported on their human rights due diligence process. So of course here, there's, there's a lot of very relevant information which is missing. Companies are not doing part of their due diligence process, which is the reporting side of things in line with the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights. And numbers fall even further if we look at more specific examples, such as you know, whether companies are providing um, details and, and indicators that illustrate effective management of human rights impacts. So uh, the information is simply not uh, not there and it doesn't allow for, for an understanding of how companies are managing their impacts and, and risks. Um, and likewise, if we move down to the um, supply chain findings, supply chain transparency is pretty much absent. So we found it around, um, you know, I think it was around 3%. I won't filter the results because it's actually it opens up quite a few tabs. And uh, But just to show you that you can filter results by sector. So if you look, for example, at the apparel, so garment uh, industry, which is at particularly high risk when it comes to human rights along the supply chain, for example, very few companies report on the um, on, on their supply chain, so that provide data on, on supply chain transparency. So I think this was a long answer to, to answer Charlotte's question, just to say that, you know, there's the information is simply missing. Um, and in this context, that's why we very much welcome the decision of the European Commission to um, reform the EU non-financial reporting directive. So in, in April, we can expect a proposal for the reform of the EU non-financial reporting directive and also develop EU standards to accompany the reform of the directive. And this offers an opportunity to, let's say, clarify what companies should be reporting with regards to human rights impacts and, and how they manage them. Um, and alongside uh, another piece of legislation which is relevant uh, at the moment, and that's the upcoming uh, proposal for mandatory human rights due diligence uh, in Europe, we can expect the combination of these different pieces of legislation to really promote, um, to advance, let's say, how companies manage, um, manage their impacts and, and provide, prevent impacts. So I'll stop sharing um, and hand over. How can I stop sharing? Voila and hand uh, over back to you, Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanne. That was um, that was incredibly interesting. And yeah, I think absolutely your findings absolutely echo what we saw with the WDI, which is that companies are generally very good at talking about the commitments that they have and generally very bad at having any kind of data to actually demonstrate that those um, that those commitments are being implemented um, at all, exactly. to be honest. Um, okay, Nikolai, I will, um, I will hand over to you. Um, yeah, it would be great to hear your thoughts on where we currently stand in terms of reporting. Yeah, so I think from PRI's point of view, there's kind of two aspects that's interesting to talk about. There's obviously uh, the way we encourage reporting ourselves as a, as a membership organization, remembering that institutional investors are, of course, companies as well, uh, although their primary role is to finance um, um, yeah, or invest. Um, so that's, that's the first thing I'll, I'll talk through. And the other thing is just on, on the role that we try to play um, in terms of our public policy activities uh, to so, support some of the initiatives that Joanne mentioned, uh, particularly in the EU at the moment. Um, so on the first one, um, I would describe the way that investors are looking at ESG issues as we've come a really long way in terms of the, let's say the materiality of issues, um, understanding those, incorporating them into investment processes. Um, I would the next 
the next move though, uh, I think is more on the outcomes. So if, if we think about the double materiality concept that they currently use in the EU, we obviously talk about the, the way sustainability issues in the world might impact a company or might impact a portfolio. And the other way is how a company's activities or investment activities in the case of the PRI impacts on sustainability issues in the in the real world. So there's like an outwards in and there's an inwards out. And I think the second part is where we're kind of seeing the next developments now. I mean, this is very, this is very obvious in, in the EU, uh, not only in terms of some of the initiatives that has already been mentioned, but also the whole idea of taxonomies. So environmental taxonomies and potentially social taxonomies is really about uh, trying to document um, you know, the relationship with these sustainability issues much more clearly. So that's a trend we're seeing. And that's something we've reflected in our reporting framework uh, starting this year, which is built much more around an idea of sustainability outcomes, not, not forgetting the first part, because that's incredibly important. Investors need to manage risks and opportunities, and they need to understand sustainability issues from that point of view. But I think there is a clear push from beneficiaries of the financial system, as well as, as uh, pension funds and other asset owners, uh, to be much more clear on, on the role they play uh, themselves as well. So, so that's a clear trend we see. And of course, there is a, the value change is extremely complex. And the, the way in which, uh, which investors are thinking about sustainability issues and speaking to their investees, uh, their companies, will impact you know, the priorities of those companies. So I think it's important that we make sure that there's alignment between those regimes that concerns investor reporting, as well as those regimes that concern corporate reporting. So that kind of leads me to my second point, which is that we do obviously try and play an active role here, um, giving input into policy processes to be clear on what it is investors are looking for. Um, we have, um, I have colleagues that are much more engaged uh, on, on the um, uh, non-financial reporting uh, directive review. Uh, we're participating in the platform for sustainable finance, the chief responsible investment officer of the PRI, Nathan Fabian is the chair of that. Um, and I myself are participating as an observer in the social taxonomy subgroup of the platform. So that is just to say that we are really, um, we're really concerned with these issues, of course, in terms of convergence of the, the reporting requirements that we have and alignment. But we also do recognize that it's not only a question of standardization, because I don't think we necessarily have all the right uh, indicators at this point. So we do also sometimes need to take a step back and reflect on what I actually the key points of information that, that we need. And uh, obviously the workforce um, disclosure initiative is, is key to this and similar voluntary initiatives are key to sort of exploring um, uh, new new boundaries, if you will, on, on the reporting side. Um, so over to you, Shada. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Thank you so much. And I think, I think you raise a really important point, particularly around um, kind of moving towards a more outcome oriented approach to reporting. I think that sometimes it's easy to forget what the purpose of reporting is. Like reporting is not an, an end in itself, but it is a, a tool to drive better sustainability outcomes for companies and ultimately for, um, for society. And I think it's really important to emphasize that, um, that framing when we're having those kind of discussions. Um, we've just had a question pop through in the chat, which is, um, which is about the research that you mentioned, Joanne, and um, on what companies and sectors were included in that. Yes, so we assessed, as I mentioned, um, we had two rounds of, of research, the first in 2019, where we assessed 1000 companies. And in 2020, we assessed uh, another 300 company reports, but the latter we focused specifically on climate and environmental uh, disclosures um, from, from countries, uh, from, from companies based in countries from Central, Eastern and Southern Europe. Whereas for the former, so for the 1000 companies, we looked at 11 different sectors sectors representing the main let's say economic activities in uh, in Europe so what I can do maybe shortly is also share the the link to the Alliance for Corporate Transparency website where you can uh, actually see a we have a, a map with with an indication of what sectors we looked at but we have I mean on top of my head we had the extractives we had financial sector we had um, garment we had food and beverage so you know the the, the key sectors that the um, you know, reflect the main economic activities in Europe. Um, and we looked at, country, at companies from all different countries in the, in the EU. So we really tried to have, let's say, a very balanced, um, a balanced sample. 
Um, what I didn't mention is that as well as having the results on an online database where you can when you can also filter the results by country and by sector, if that's of interest, or you can compare different results. We also have a, a report where we summarize the key findings and the key messages, and we compared how companies report um, in different regions. So since, of course, you know, the bigger countries in Europe, such as Germany or France, um, had the biggest amount of companies in there, when we did this comparison, we looked at companies from a regional perspective. Um, so, so that's just, just for you to know, when you look at the report, we didn't compare countries, but you know, each country individually, but we, we grouped countries into relevant uh, regions. But I hope this answers the question. It's a very broad sample that was aimed at really reflecting just the European situation. And, and maybe a quick point is that our objective was not to assess, you know, or to compare companies between each other, but it was really just to provide a picture of how companies are reporting in Europe. So is the information there relevant? Yes or no? Uh, rather than saying, okay, company A as opposed to company B provided more or less information. That wasn't the, the objective. It was really to provide that data to prove that there's you know, that there are ga gaps and that we need to find a way to improve the quality and relevance and comparability of, of corporate disclosure. Great, right. thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Joanne. Um, so the next question, um, I think, is kind of speaking to that point about the broader, uh, broader landscape for sustainability reporting. I think we hear um, quite often that the sustainability reporting landscape can be a bit of an, an alphabet soup, I think is a favorite phrase of, um, of different initiatives and frameworks. I was wondering if, um, if both of you could explain some of the problems and the opportunities associated with a diversified and sometimes convergent landscape, both, um, both in terms of reporting, but also in terms of practice for companies and for investors and, um, and wider stakeholders. I will, Joanne, I'll hand over to you first. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, definitely. So I think to start, what I would like to refer to is one of the findings of the EU Project Task Force on EU standards. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the European Commission announced that as well as uh, reforming the EU Non-Financial Reporting Directive, they intend to develop EU standards to clarify, let's say, what it is that companies should be reporting. And in this context, they uh, mandated a project task force under the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, EFRAG, uh, maybe some of you would recognize the name. They mandated this project task force to uh, develop, let's say, or to come up with recommendations on the ideal content and structure of, of uh, future EU, EU standards and how they should connect to existing reporting initiatives and frameworks, for example. And one of the findings there was that there are, you know, companies are faced with over 5,000 key performance indicators from 41 different initiatives to, to choose from when it comes to their reporting. So I think when people talk about the alphabet soup, you know, thinking of these numbers really provides an understanding of why we use this, uh, this expression, which has become so common in the last, uh, in the last few months. Um, and, and in that sense, I think if you think of so many indicators and these very different reporting uh, initiatives, some of the challenges are that not all of them, of course, can be relevant. If you think of 5,000 indicators, it, it, it comes to mind, even, even without, you know, assessing each and every single one individually, but it does, it does kind of pop in, in, in my mind, at least, the question of, are all of these relevant? Uh, and, and also, through the uh, research and the methodology of the Alliance for Corporate Transparency, we did come across, you know, a lot of indicators out there that simply don't, don't really mean anything and that aren't particularly uh, relevant. And if you think, for example, of, of human rights, there are specific initiatives that, such as the WDI or, or SHIFT that are based on expertise and they're based on an understanding of what impacts on, on people are, for example, but a lot of them, a lot of the other initiatives aren't as, as much. Um, another, for example, issue is that, of course, uh, since there are so many options to choose from, it's really hard to compare uh, information disclosed by, by companies. Um, I, I think UNPRI may, you know, Nicola, you might have a better understanding than me of, of this aspect here, but also in the discussions that we've had, whether that was with NGOs or with, with investors, it's simply difficult to compare the information of different companies which is particularly relevant if you put it in the context also of achieving certain sustainability goals that you know, uh, different jurisdictions in the world might have at EU level. Uh, European Commissioner McGuinness stated that we need an additional investment of 
500 billion euros yearly to achieve the objectives of the EU Green Deal. And without the comparability and relevance of data, we simply can't redirect capitals towards that, um, towards you know, the sustainable investments and ultimately achieve those, those goals. So these are some of the, I would say, some of the, some of the challenges. And uh, going back to the, the opportunities of having these different initiatives, again, I'd like to mention, and I've referred a couple of times to this, uh, to the recommendations of the project task force, but I think there are some very good points in, in the final report produced by, by, by the, the PTF, as some people call it, the project task force. One of the recommendations is that companies should, you know, the, the EU, future EU standards should focus on three different levels of reporting. Uh, those being sector agnostic, sector specific, and entity specific levels of reporting. So standards should be developed, you know, or, or companies should be reporting on, on uh, indicators and criteria that are relevant for all companies, no matter what their sector uh, or the sector that they operate in, then there should be, of course, definitely be sector specific ones. And in that sense, it's definitely the, the, you know, the reform of the directive and the development of, of standards op offer an opportunity to have that you know, a baseline of mandatory uh, criteria that would allow for the relevance and comparability of information. But then we have the entity specific uh, reporting and that's, for example, one of the opportunities for, um, I would say, for, for, for reporting initiatives, companies on their own need to make an assessment of you know, what their target audience is with the reporting, uh, what are their specific uh, issues and, and or impacts and, and risks and voluntary uh, initiatives offer an opportunity for companies to, um, you know, to choose what is relevant for, for their own specific uh, context and, and situation. Um, with, a, with a little side note that of course, there's, it's important that even within this context, quality criteria are taken into account. However, as I mentioned, there's 5,000 KPIs, uh, many, many uh, initiatives. One of the other recommendations of the project task force is, you know, ensuring that there's quality criteria against which the quality of reporting um, criteria, I keep repeating the same word, sorry, but against which the quality of these reporting criteria should be uh, assessed. So in choosing these voluntary frameworks and initiatives, I think that element of quality and relevance needs to be uh, taken into, into account. So I think I'll, I'll conclude here and hand over back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. I think that's, I think that, um, I think that you've, that was a really, really good demonstration of the way that these kind of ban, um, mandatory and voluntary standards can coexist in a really um a really helpful way but also we lose Shada. is is my computer frozen or nicolai can you hear can you hear charlotte i Ooh. can hear you and i think Shada is back can you okay, hear me now? Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I will I will now to save any more dodgy internet issues, I will swiftly hand over to Nikolai to get um to get your perspective on this. Yeah, sure. No, I, I very much agree with the um, sort of the landscape you you've both painted. Um I, I saw it referred to in a report, I think last week, uh, ref, uh, calling it the turbulent teens is what we're going through in terms of sustainability and, and reporting and indicators. So I think that's certainly true. Um, one of the things I mentioned earlier was this distinction between um, ESG factors as uh, financial material factors and the way that that's understood, um, and then sustainability performance, which I think there's a lot of focus on now and where perhaps companies have been a bit ahead of investors. So I think that's an important distinction that's being clarified these days, and that's, that's hopefully helping us. Uh, but on top of that, of course, we are also dealing with uh, different national uh, as well as regional frameworks and standards here. Um, and I was participating in an event on Monday where um, it was a group of legal professionals uh, and, and one of the people presenting had a slide on the amount of um, instruments, legal instruments uh, that companies and investors are subject to. And she was kind of showing uh, the move from 2000 to 2010, then from 10 to 13 and 13 to 20. And there's just been such a huge surge in uh, the amount of instruments that companies and investors have to deal with. Um, it's a symptom of something positive, I think, which is recognizing that we are facing some really severe sustainability issues. And uh, those issues have been externalized and not being dealt with by actors in, in, the, in the system. 
And so therefore policymakers are obviously trying to address that. That's a positive thing. Um, then there's the question of different sort of uh, needs from investors, companies, the regulators, uh, as well as civil society. And here again, I think we, we've just had some deviating perspectives on what it is we're actually looking for in terms of data, but I see some positive development. So just to mention some of the positive developments, which uh, give me uh, some courage that we're going in the right direction. One would be to sort of focus on international standards in the likes of due diligence regimes that we're seeing. Although some are focused on narrow set of um, human rights, for example, modern slavery or child labor, uh, we've obviously seen the vigilance uh, law in France, which is broader. They all seem to build on the same idea of due diligence. So that's a, a, a quite a positive step, I think. And uh, we're seeing a number of member states in Europe right now uh, presenting their own um, um, legal uh, solutions to this. And obviously the, the EU is stepping in to hopefully uh, implement a regional consistent uh, approach to this. So I think that's, first of all, very positive. The second one is, um, and I'm going to mention climate as an issue here, because what we've seen with the environmental taxonomy, for me, is kind of the next step. Uh, I mentioned it earlier. I think we're really getting to the point of documenting um, how a company's activity at the real activity level, first of all, and then aggregating that, how they are addressing um, net zero uh, commitments and how aligned they are with the EU's um, uh, Green New Deal. Uh, and that's going to help investors and the end users in the financial system tremendously, because then we're going to start to be able to compare uh, portfolios or investment products, whether it's in our pension fund or through our bank. Uh, and that kind of alignment in the standard, so the Paris Agreement, uh, European policy commitments, real science-based uh, information, I think that's, that's, that's going to take us very far. So. Um, yeah, just to conclude, uh, there, it's probably quite a frustrating time for companies and investors because they're subject to these many standards, but I, I do think there is some direction that's, that's um, quite positive. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Nikolai. So um, now we'll move on to focus a bit more on um, the kind of current developments that are happening. And I think uh, that previous question um, kind of perfectly lines us up to discuss how the um, these kind of proposed plans, the, the NFRD um, and um, and the work from the PRI are going to address these, um, these kind of shortfalls that there may be with the current approach to uh, reporting. I will, Joanne, I'll hand over to you first. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I mean, I think the objective uh, is, is quite clear of the European Commission no? with the reform of the non-financial reporting directive as part of the, of the EU Green Deal and the development of EU non-financial reporting standards to accompany the reform itself. The, the objective is really to ensure relevance and, and comparability of, of disclosure. Um, and of course, this is important for, for various reasons, uh, including, for example, being able to hold companies accountable on the one hand. So, you know, from the impact side of their activities and the impact side of materiality, for example, and also to allow investors, as I mentioned earlier, to redirect capital flows towards sustainable investments to achieve ultimately the objectives of the EU Green Deal. So this is what we know, that the Commission will present this uh, proposal for the reform of the directive. Um, this will be done uh, almost certainly on the 21st of uh, April. So in April, we can expect to see the, or towards the end of April, we can expect to see this uh, uh, proposal by the Commission. We'll have to wait a bit longer for the EU, um, EU standards. Uh, of course, once the, the proposal is presented by uh, the Commission, it will pass at the level of the European Parliament and the Council of the Member States for discussions on, um, on how to move forward in that sense. So in terms of the specifics of the proposals and, and what, you know, what the proposed advancements in this sense are, we'll have to wait a little bit uh, longer. But what I, can, what I can say is that from our side, from the Alliance for Corporate Transparency, we've been very much engaged in all the policy discussions to, uh, to steer the, the reform of the direct. And, and, and provide recommendations on how to ensure that we can uh, advance and, and improve um, sustainability reporting by, by reforming the, the legislative framework around it. Um, and we developed uh, recommendations that include, for example, 
also as mentioned by Nikolai, clarifying the concept of double materiality and its application, um, enlarging the scope of the you know, non-financial uh, reporting uh, directive. Uh, currently is 500 companies with more than, um, sorry, companies with more than 500 employees and uh, that are publicly listed, and this can be expected to be uh, expanded. Um, there's, you know, we have, I can also share with you the, the link to, the, um, to, the, to, the, to these recommendations. Um, we also have, you know, a recommendation on ensuring better connectivity of the information disclosed by companies. Uh, currently, it's not clear why a company might report on a specific human rights issue. There's no connection to the business model or the information is, is not provided. Um, and importantly, another recommendation would be to specify the thematic and, and sector specific uh, reporting requirements uh, by companies. So ensure that, you know, there's an indication of what issues companies should be reporting on that can ensure, for example, uh, placing their activity within the EU goals of you know, achieving uh, or setting science-based targets as well, reconnecting to what was said earlier, achieving the Paris Agreement goals, but also being in line with the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights and ensuring proper human rights due, due diligence. Um, and, and what we do know, though we still have to wait for the proposal by the Commission, is we can expect this to be in line with the thinking of, of the Commission, also based on the questions included in its public consultation, where uh, the Commission aimed at gathering input from different stakeholders on how to move forward with the reform of, of the directive. There are some, some differences. Um, I think for the interest of time, I'll try to keep this, uh, keep this uh, short, um, but one of the main differences from, from our side is that, you know, um, these, the, the specification of, of thematic issues is something that the European Commission seems to want to postpone, uh, sorry, postpone to mandate and delegate to the European standard setter. Um, and, and we have some you know, concerns with this um, since the standard setter will be a technical body, but deciding the priorities for reporting uh, should, is definitely a political, a political decision uh, placed within a political context. Um, so it's definitely something that should be in the hands of, of uh, policymakers as opposed to, to the standard setter uh, itself. And then, of course, the standard setter should develop the more specific methodologies and standards and, and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, I think I'll stop here. I, I know we're running out of time and we still have some other points to, to discuss. Uh, but yeah, this is just to say, you know, we can all expect further details on what the Commission plans in the upcoming weeks with the proposal being published at the end of, the, uh, of next month. Um, and yeah, I'll be happy to share the link to the Alliance for Corporate Transparency recommendations, as I mentioned, with uh, a couple of points of diger a divergence. I think those are the key points that we can still expect the Commission to actually be addressing in its, in its proposal. So I'll hand over to Charlotte. I think you're back, Shannon. Perfect. <laughs> Always seems to go just as it's my time to. All right, may, uh, maybe I can make a few comments just on this um, while we wait for Charlotte to return. Um, so, just want to say from the from the PR, PRI's point of view. Um, you know, we're obviously really supportive of these um, ongoing discussions around uh, disclosure um, at the EU level. You, um, I think one thing, one thing to keep in mind. Uh, I think there's some delay from when Charlie might have been trying to speak earlier. Yeah, it might be a delay. Yeah. No, but what one thing I think it's just important to highlight is that these voluntary initiatives. Um, you know, un unless they're followed uh, with, um, let's say, requirements such as we're seeing with mandatory due diligence, um, we're quite skeptical that it's going to go far enough. And I think Frank Bull's uh, research suggests that. I mean, we've had the UN guiding principles for, for 10 years now. There has been reporting frameworks uh, available in the market. Uh, yes, we can get better. Yes, we can be more clear on the specific indicators. But it's not like we're starting from scratch. So to see such a low number of companies still um, seriously engaging on due diligence is obviously extremely disappointing. And I think the German government took a similar approach in their own legislation. They, they gave German companies a time period uh, to respond. 
uh, on a voluntary basis and they, if they didn't they would they would legislate for it and obviously they've had to legislate for it so i, I think that's just a sobering um insight to have in mind when it comes to disclosure regimes and voluntary and industry-led um, activities it only goes so far i mean it helps uh, change our understanding of where we need to go but in terms of the more substantial market failures that we are cons consistently seeing it doesn't solve the problem so if you want to move economies if you want to move sectors you you have to unfortunately <laughs> it seems have a much more um, mandatory uh, instruments in place yeah, and if I can maybe just quickly react to that, Nikolai, you, you mentioned a very important point, which we definitely support as well, is the, the reform of uh, the non-financial reporting directive and the EU, EU standards will only be as successful as other pieces of legislation that are tied to ensuring that we actually promote better practice. In, and one of those being mandatory human rights um, due diligence legislation, which you know uh, provides an obligation for companies to identify, prevent, and, and mitigate human rights risks. But you know we need to, of course, clarify what the reporting side of things needs to deal with and how that can be improved. But you know the success of that and highly depends, and both the success of each uh, initiative highly depends on on the relevance uh, of of the other. So I just wanted to echo that point you made, which I think is extremely important. Thank you. Uh, thank you both so much. I think, yeah, um, I think really, really excellent points. And I definitely, I completely agree, Nikolai, on the point of, I think, to, to create systemic change, um, voluntary initiatives, unfortunately, just, um, just aren't enough. And you really do need that push on a, on a much broader kind of uh, national, international legislative um, kind of scope of things. I, um, I wonder if I could go back to you again, Nikolai, and ask you, um, how you feel about if the proposed legislation um, actually goes far enough to protect human rights and mitigate risk? We spent quite a lot of time talking about how it's much better than some things that we um, that we currently have. But do you think that it's um, it's sufficient? And if companies should actually be looking to go beyond the kind of current and proposed requirements and actually introduce their own measures to better protect their workers um, and themselves from the consequences of material risks? Yeah, so I don't know if people how aware people today are of, um, of, of where we are in the process, but there was obviously a consultation called the Sustainable Corporate Governance Consultation um, undertaken, I think it closed about a month ago, uh, which included a range of different elements. There was a proposal to review um, director duties um, across Europe. There were ideas around mandatory due diligence, both for environmental issues and human rights. Um, there were ideas about going beyond the requirements that we know from the UN guiding principles and the OECD guidelines also to more positive, um, let's say, trajectories on business strategy, on net zero, um, so more quantitative uh, aspects as well, if you will. There were um, proposals around executive nomination, uh, remuneration, it's called, <laughs> tied to EST issues uh, as well. So we obviously don't know where it's heading because to my understanding, the European Commission is now digesting uh, quite a lot of feedback on that. But there was an indication with the European Parliament, uh, Lara Walters, who is a Dutch MEP, uh, who submitted a report um, on this. And there were really encouraging uh, signs in there in terms of uh, recognizing the full spectrum of human rights, the full value chain, um, ideas around uh, proper accountability and so forth. So, uh, we've actually been very encouraged by that uh, that aspect of it. I think the question of director duties is a bit more complex. And perhaps, I mean, PRI's feedback was that that was a bit simplistically laid out by the commission. Uh, and I do believe just from what I've seen others comment that uh, there were some concerns there as well. I think John Roggy, obviously the, the man behind the UN guiding principles also commented that he was a little bit more concerned with that aspect and actually encouraged the commission to focus on the idea of mandatory due diligence as something which would obviously feed into director duties if that became a legal requirement. So I think it's extremely interesting um, how it's going to be implemented at the national level is going to be important and what the um, accountability mechanisms would be would be extremely important. So we don't obviously want something that becomes a tick box exercise. And I think the, the consequences for non-compliance here are extremely important. And potentially the way the courts are going to interpret the requirements and the standards they're going to indirectly set around um, what appropriate or adequate due diligence looks like 
because I think we have a lot of learning here still in terms of um, actually good corporate uh, approaches to due diligence. But overall, I would say extremely um, encouraged by the direction. Great, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Nicola. And yeah, I feel I, I completely agree. I think it seems like we're, um, things are definitely moving, moving in the right direction. And hopefully that will be, um, that will be evidence in the kind of final, final results of these, um, of these processes. I have a, a slightly more practical question for you now, Joanne, which is on how, um, how organizations can actually prepare for increasing um, mandatory human rights uh, due diligence obligations and what measures can be put in place at the company level so that reporting in this area um, isn't really seen as a burden, but actually to companies really take advantage of the benefits that it can offer them. Thank you very much. And I really like the, the way this question is, is framed. It, I think it highlights how important it is, and this connects to also what Nikolai was mentioning, and it highlights how it's important to connect discussion on human rights due diligence and other, let's say, pieces of legislation. So we have the non-financial reporting directive, we have the sustainable corporate governance initiatives with the roles of boards and, um, and, and human rights uh, due diligence initiative um, as well. Um, and as we have discussed until now, the, you know, the Commission will present a proposal on the NFRD covering the human rights uh, due diligence reporting side of things. But on top of that, we have also the mandatory human rights uh, due diligence, um, which highlights the importance of having a horizontal mandatory obligation on companies to carry out uh, a process or have a process that allows them to properly identify, prevent and, and mitigate their impacts on, on people and planet and making sure that all these processes interact um, is definitely key for the success of, of both initiatives, as I mentioned earlier, and also to you know ensure that we actually achieve the results that we that we want to that we want to um, achieve. So in terms of what companies you know should implement, what are the processes? I think that's a you know um, it's very difficult to answer in a standardized way. I think what we need to avoid is a tick the box exercise where you know there's a, a process which is followed by everyone blindly uh, simply to say yeah we've conducted due diligence we've uh, reported information there is we've we've done everything it's about really going um or changing the mindset of companies to use this as an opportunity you know it's about an, an investigative journey let's say uh, into the operations of of companies where companies need to make sure that they map their risks adequately using guidance that's out there such as the united nation guiding principles and and uh, oecd uh, guidance but what we do need to avoid is really just this ticks the book tick the box exercise but using this as an opportunity to really uh, manage risks and impacts to all stakeholders of uh, of the company um and again since I've done this a couple of times and I'll, I'll conclude on, on that note as well, referring again to the project task force uh, recommendations, um, there's one section of the report that outlines how companies, you know, can prioritize uh, human rights impacts and, and risks for the purpose of, of reporting. And I think that, you know, sets out a process or some indications that can help companies to identify these risks and, and impacts that they ought to be reporting on and which can help also in managing uh, these risks and impacts. And that's, you know, outlining how companies should assess their action potential impacts by reviewing their own activities, um, the products and the services they provide and how they are sourced, who's involved in their production and so on, um, but also through their business relationships, so not sticking to your own activities, but through your own other business uh, relationships and the upstream and, and downstream value chain, for example. Um, it's important to assess the context in which the company operates, understand what's happening around the company, engage with relevant stakeholders that are either, you know, de facto or, or potentially affected by, by a company. So there's impacts for these affected stakeholders, but also engage in experts that can provide an insight into these uh, potential impacts. So what I would do is also recommend uh, referring to the section of the report I can share. I've mentioned I would share a couple of links. I'll do it very quickly before we finish the, the discussion. Um, but yeah, I think it's really about changing the mindset of companies, making sure that they map the risks and act upon those, uh, those risks. Um, and I think this also leads me back to one of the points that Nikolai was mentioning about this uh, sustainable corporate governance initiative, which uh, will, is expected to cover two uh, aspects. There's the uh, human rights and environmental due diligence on the other side, and there's the director's duties on, on the other. 
uh, we're trying to, this, this has caused a bit of confusion, all the questions on the director's duties, and we're trying to refocus the direct the discussion on ensuring that there's board oversight. So within this context, I think to ensure that there's further advancement and place that third, let's say, element in the discussion on NFRD, human rights due diligence, rather than talking about director's duties, it's about the board oversight of the results of these uh, human rights due diligence processes and how those results should be integrated in the company's overall strategy uh, in order that we can actually address the issues identified. So I'll stop there and hand over back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. I think I think that was a, a perfect, um, a perfect kind of summary of how all of these initiatives, um, initiatives fit together and they're really um, kind of mutually reinforcing and enabling and um, which I think is I think is great. So now we don't have too much time left, but we do have some time for some questions. Um, if anyone has any questions, please either put your hand up or pop them in the chat. I have um, I have one question here already, which I will ask, and then we'll hopefully have time for maybe for one more, um, which is on kind of that we've been seeing um, seeing greater moves for consolidation in sustainability reporting on an international level, and um, particularly in regards to the recent IFRS um, consultation. And um, I think I think for both of our speakers, how do you see um, kind of EU measures such as the NFRD fitting into the context and I guess um, or complementing or sitting alongside um, alongside the potential IFRS role in um, in standard setting, I guess, especially given that the focus for now for the IFRS seems to be um, is not on the social um, the social aspect as well. Um, yeah, we'll hand it. Nicola, I'll hand over to you first as you're unmuted. I'm, a, I'm actually humbly going to say, I think Joanne is probably more the expert on this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if that's okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> Sorry, Charlotte, I thought, were you saying something or should I go? I was back? literally just about to say you go. So, <laughs> okay, okay. No, it's just to say, I think. Of course, it's important to, to head towards, uh, you know, an, an alignment at international level, but um, of course, with, with the work that's happening at European level, we're, we're seeing such a speedy, there's such a quick move towards improving sustainability. We have very urgent goals. Um, so it's definitely important that we have a convergence of all these initiatives eventually, but it's also important to have, you know, the EU standards and um, this is you know what, what we would think definitely the need to focus on EU standards at, at the moment to ensure that you know based on the needs of the European uh, Union we achieve those goals uh, whether those are you know social goals and, and environmental as you mentioned right now uh, there's other initiatives where the focus on social is perhaps less uh, less prominent as, as the focus on, on environmental and climate related uh, let's see themes so definitely we, we see the need to ensure that, you know, there's EU standards developed and then eventually link those also to uh, once the time comes to, to other international initiatives. The timeline really, for there's also different timelines. So we can expect the EU standards to be ready at an earlier stage compared to the IFRS standards, which will probably take, uh, take a bit longer. So uh, in that sense, I see, you know, in having alignment of international standards eventually definitely as a point of, of uh, arrival or to, to point towards, um, but different jurisdictions have different needs at the moment and, and we're on different, let's say, uh, timelines. So um, definitely it's important not to, I mean, some, some may claim, well, let's not focus on the EU standards and focus directly on, on the international ones. I think that's not the solution for us at the moment. There's definitely a need to, you know, focus on the EU level set, set uh, standards that are relevant given our objectives and then eventually move towards the, the internationalization. So that was a bit of a confused answer, but I hope I hope that made the point. <laughs> no, that's, um, no, that's great. Thank you, John. No, I definitely, I definitely agree that um, that the the kind of existence of international standards should not prevent um the eu being ambitious and getting on with things um things quite quickly i think the the faster that quality sustainability standards are developed and implemented anywhere in the world the better um okay so i think that that's um that's all we have time for today I would like to say a massive, massive thank you to our fantastic speakers for such a stimulating, um, stimulating conversation. If you have any 
remaining questions or have any um, have an interest in following up on this topic, um, please get in touch with, um, you can get in touch with us and the WDI and we can pass any questions you have on. And also um, just to remember to visit uh, shareaction.org slash WDI to view the full findings report and find out more about the 2020 cycle of, um, of the WDI. And also Joanne has just posted a link to the, um, to the Alliance website if you would like to see um, any more into some of the research that she mentioned and some of those things. So I will um, leave it there. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great, uh, great rest of day. Thanks, Adam. Thank you very much.